Hello everyone. Here in video number six of the series, I'll be installing the Y-axis ball screw assembly and also cutting and drilling into the cast iron base to extend the Y-axis travel. The Y-axis ball screw assembly from the kit is a double nut ball screw style. Having a double ball nut setup reduces backlash more effectively than having a single ball nut. Backlash is caused by a loose fit between the ball nut and the ball screw and with a double ball nut, the fit can be made very tight. One of the downsides to having a double ball nut is that it is twice as long as a single ball nut. And if clearance is not made in the casting, then the Y-axis travel will be reduced by a couple of inches. In its stock configuration, the G0704 has a cross travel in the Y-axis of just under seven inches. Installing a double ball nut without modifying the casting will reduce that cross travel to around 5 inches. Since I'd like to maintain as much cross travel as possible, I'm going to cut into the cast iron base. When I started this project, I looked around the internet for information on where to cut and how much to cut, but I didn't find anything that was definitive. As a result, I just sort of set off on my own, and this is how it went. The maker of the kit, Arizona CNC kits said that the y-axis ball screw goes in from the top and I needed to open up the hole in the front to one and a quarter inches. He also said that I could open up the slot on the top to gain a little more cross travel. As we go along you'll see that I actually took more material out of the top slot than I needed to. I laid the double ball nut on the top of the casting and traced around it to get a rough idea of where I needed to cut. The cast iron is only about a quarter inch thick in that area, and I used a reciprocating saw with a blade with carbide teeth. A cheaper bimetal blade probably would have worked for such a small cut, but the carbide tip blade cut through it like butter. Once the two longitudinal cuts were made, I needed to make a cross cut. For this cut, I bought a carbide tip blade for a multi-tool that I had. With such small teeth, it cut much slower than the reciprocating saw but it completed the cut in less than five minutes. Here you can see the thickness of the cast iron. With carbide blades, it really wasn't much of a problem. The cuts aren't very pretty, but they're no rougher than the iron casting. With the slot on the top opened up, I turned my attention to the hole in the front. The only tool I have for enlarging the hole is a half inch cordless drill. I didn't have an inch and a quarter drill bit, but what I did have was an inch and three eighths step drill bit. So, I figure I'd start with that and see how it goes. I ran the step bit in up to the inch and a quarter step, and that's where I stopped. I tried to finish out the hole using a half inch end mill in the drill and cutting sideways, but it was just too slow going. Eventually, I decided to just go and buy an inch and a quarter hole saw. In hindsight, that's what I should have started with. Since the hole was already partially drilled, and there was nothing to hold the pilot bit in the middle of the hole. I 3D printed a disc that fits snugly in the hole to guide the pilot bit. The hole saw was just bimetal rather than carbide, but it still cut through the cast iron without much trouble. After just a couple of minutes of drilling, I had an inch and a quarter hole in the casting. Now that I could get the ball screw assembly into the casting, I could see more clearly where I needed more clearance. I needed to open the slot on the top just a little bit wider. For this task, I used a four and a half inch angle grinder. Here you can see where the ball nut assembly moves into the little bit wider section of the slot. I probably could have left the front inch and a half of the casting in place, but I don't think it'll hurt anything. Here's what it looks like with the ball nut at the full Y negative limit of travel. You can see where the end of the ball nut is going to protrude into that new inch and a quarter hole. The next order of business is dealing with the clearance for the cross braces at the bottom of the casting. I laid the mill over to get a view of the bottom of the casting. Here you can see the cross braces. The ball nuts come with a grease fitting installed, but there's no clearance for the grease fitting once the assembly is installed in the mill. I 3D printed some shallow six millimeter screws just to plug the hole where the grease fitting was. But as it turned out, the clearance was so tight that even the one and a half millimeter screw head hit on the casting. So I 3D printed a six millimeter Allen screw instead. I could have used a standard Allen screw, but the one I made in CAD 
I oversized slightly so it was self-locking, that way it would stay in place. I also decided to shave about a millimeter off of the ball nut. It wasn't actually necessary, but I had the grinder handy and why not. Here you can see the double ball nut assembly. The two ball nuts are separated by a spacer that is ground or shimmed to provide a preload on the two ball nuts. This makes for little to no backlash. Here, at the top of the ball nut, you can see a key that locks the two ball nuts together. On my assembly, that key kept lifting up out of the slot and wouldn't stay put. So, as a fix, I 3D printed a thin cylinder that would fit over the ball nut and hold it in position. It was a snug fit, so it's not going anywhere. The only reason I mention this is because you'll see this cylinder a little later in some pictures, and I just wanted to explain what it was. Next, I installed the stepper motor mount and the shaft coupling onto the ball screw. I mentioned in my first video that there was going to be successes in this build, and also inevitable failures. Well, here's one of the failures. For this next bit, I'll have to talk a little bit about the saddle. In order for the x-axis ball screw assembly to be installed, some slots have to be cut into the saddle to make clearance for the ball nut. To make the cuts, I didn't have access to a second milling machine. I also don't have a drill press, and the angle grinder didn't seem very appealing either. My plan was to buy a second saddle, and while my milling machine was still together, I could mill the slot in the new saddle, then reassemble the milling machine with the ball screws and the newly milled saddle, and once it was together, I could use the milling machine to mill the slots into my original saddle, and then put the original saddle back in the mill and sell the second saddle on eBay or Craigslist or what have you. And then this happened to the new saddle. Any experienced machinist probably knows exactly what happened here. But of course, I'm not an experienced machinist, and I learn from trial and error. And here was an error. Since I've owned this mill, I only ever milled aluminum on it. This is the first time that I've ever milled cast iron. What happened was the end mill was slipping in the collet, and it pulled itself deeper and deeper into the work as I was milling the slot. It was the first time I had experienced this, but apparently it's not an uncommon problem and the solution is to use an end mill holder instead of a collet. Here you can see an end mill holder on the top compared to a collet on the bottom. The end mill holder has got a set screw that locks the end mill firmly in place. Another lesson learned. So after that mishap, in addition to getting a set of end mill holders, I also bought yet another saddle to replace the damaged one. And that's how I come to have three saddles for my mill. This is the saddle that the end mill chewed through. I decided to continue using it and did a cheesy repair by filling in the damaged area with JB Weld, a steel reinforced epoxy. This should be more than sufficient to get the mill up and running so I can mill the clearance slots in the other two saddles. Now, back to the ball screw installation. The aluminum clamping block shown here fits into the oval slot to the right. On this saddle, the oval slot is not wide enough, which leaves a gap between the clamping block and the face of the saddle. These fitment problems are caused by differences in the castings. Here you can see the slot on my original saddle, which is about 58 millimeters wide. And on the new saddle, it's about 4 millimeters narrower. It's no wonder things need some modifications to make them fit. Have a look here at the three different saddles that I have. The one on the left is the original, about 8 or 10 years old. The one in the middle is a year or two old. And the one on the right is a couple of months old. All three of them are different. It must be pretty frustrating to make a kit for these when they keep changing the dimensions. Well, enough of that. Let's enlarge the slot and make the clamping block fit. Since I only have about a millimeter of material to remove, I decided to use my Dremel tool with a grinding stone. When I was trying to decide if I had ground off enough material or not, the battery in my Dremel tool died and decided for me. Turned out the battery had just enough juice in it to get the job done. Now that the clamping block fit properly in the slot, it was time to install the gib. Here are the gibs for the X and the Y axis. I'm not sure which one is which, but since they are significantly different sizes, 
Only one will fit into the y-axis. The first one I tried only went in a few inches, so that must be for the x-axis. But then when I tried the other gib, it slipped in and disappeared into the slot. It was about a half a millimeter too small. This is all new to me, and well, what I discovered is the gibs are custom fit for each mill. Since this is a different saddle, the original gibs no longer fit. Here's the original saddle on the right and the new saddle on the left. With the ways at the bottom lined up, you can see a significant difference in the dimensions between the ways when you compare the ones at the top, which of course is why the original gibs don't fit. I called Grizzly to see about ordering some new gibs, only to be informed that they're on back order for the next five to six months. Since that would put the whole project on hold, I needed a different solution. So, to keep with the theme of cheesy repairs, like the epoxy repair, I decided to use layers of aluminum foil to create a shim. This most certainly is not going to hold up for very long, but I only need it to last long enough to mill the clearance slot in my original saddle. With the Y-axis gib installed, it was time to do the final alignment on the Y-axis lead screw. Leaving the cap screws loose to secure the clamping block, I used my drill and the shaft coupler adapter to run the saddle all the way to the front of the mill, maximum Y negative. With the motor mount tight on the front of the mill, I turned the clamping block level and then tightened down the cap screws against the clamping block. Just to see what the approximate measurements are, I marked the maximum forward travel of the ball nut with a bit of white paint. This is with the saddle all the way against the motor mount. Then I removed the saddle, positioned the clamping block at that forward location, and put a dab of white paint on the ball nut cylinder. Here we can see about 20 millimeters of the ball nut disappears into the front of the casting when it's at maximum travel. And the last step is to check the travel. Just like I did on the Z-axis, using the shaft coupler to drill adapter that I 3D printed, I set the clutch on my cordless drill to a very light level, in this case, number three, and then run the axis through its range of motion and verify that there's no sticking or binding. And that completes the installation of the Y-axis ball screw assembly. I do plan on making a video in the future of milling out the clearance slot in the saddle for the ball nut. In the next video, number seven, I'll be installing the X-axis ball screw assembly and table. Oh yeah, and 3D printing a gib for the x-axis just to see if it'll work. Subscribe if you want to follow along.